Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so, um, just uh, administrative note, uh, my dog is here. Um, hopefully none of you mind that. He's very friendly. Uh, if someone has a problem with the presence of a dog, please let me know. Uh, but in general, uh, he should not be uh, more destructive than uh, the typical um, student. So, uh, okay, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Let me just briefly remind you of where we left off last class. So um, last class, we formulated the theory of special relativity in geometric terms. So um, in special relativity, uh, space-time is uh, Minkowski space, which we abbreviate R superscript 3 comma 1. And what that means is that the invariant interval interval uh, as measured by some observer traveling along a world line or path through space-time. Now, remember that a path through space-time is given by a set of four functions that depend on some continuous parameter lambda that labels points on that path. Uh, so the invariant interval is given by the integral of ds, where ds is given by the formula eta mu nu dx mu dx nu, uh, where dx mu represents an infinitesimal displacement of the coordinate mu, uh, and eta mu nu is the Minkowski metric, which was the 4x4 four four matrix with diagonal entries minus 1, plus 1, plus 1, plus 1. So evaluating this formula, this will be something like the integral d lambda along the world line of the square root of eta mu nu uh, x mu dot x nu dot, where dot is uh, just a shorthand for d by d lambda. So uh, this quantity ds is uh, a very important quantity uh, as it is the object that one uses to measure the invariant length or the invariant interval along world lines. Uh, it is often referred to as the line element. And it is the basic structure which packages in all of the information about the geometry of Minkowski space, because it's what you use to measure distances, or the analog of distance, the invariant interval, in special relativity. And my claim is that, in general relativity, uh, the basic physics is the same as in special relativity, except the line element will now be given by some more complicated uh, metric. So the line element will be of the form g mu nu dx mu dx nu, where g mu nu is a set of 16 quantities that might have some rather complicated dependence on the coordinates x. And uh, what I would like to do then is uh, explain why it is that a theory of gravity can be formulated in terms of a non-constant metric in this manner. Um, before I do so, uh, are there any questions, comments? Yes. Uh, for me, it's about the ideas. I have the first question, and the one that's from the book. Uh, okay. If I have the rotating particle... Okay, okay you're going to have to tell me what that question is, because oh. I don't remember. Well, it, what I, it's, it's part of the question I have. It's just the other rotating particle I have to ask. I want to ask a question about the... Um, the, the um, um, what is it? The down, the proper time of that... Uh, yes. Do you just take... Um, we define the, a new metric from the transformation to go into a repeating frame and then take the value element, or is it something else? Um, yes. So, um, for example, uh, as we um, described last class, and we'll describe uh, more this class, uh, the metric only takes the diagonal form where it's minus 1, plus 1, plus 1, plus 1 uh, in Cartesian coordinates. But, for example, in other coordinates, uh, the metric may take other forms. 
and in fact, that's something that I'm going to describe uh, momentarily, um, and is the basic, uh, and so that's, that's a basic observation that will be, uh, that, that will be elucidating, uh, today. And indeed, on your problem set, you work out the transformation of the metric and the Minkowski metric in various different coordinate systems. So, of course, um, uh, the, f the, uh, form of the metric will depend on, uh, what coordinate system you choose to write it in. Uh, so that's something that I'll explain, in fact, right now. And also, how would that be different from Eta Mu Nu? It's written in a different coordinate. Uh, well, Eta Mu Nu is just a particular name. G Mu Nu is a symbol that we use to refer to a, a general uh, metric, not necessarily the metric so of... the new metric you get from, uh, if you change your, your uh, Eta Mu Nu to something else, yes. then would that be the same as any G Mu Nu, like a general metric? Or you, um, do you miss something? I guess I'm not quite sure what you mean. G mu nu is a symbol that we use to refer to a general metric. Eta mu nu is the symbol that we use to refer to the metric of Minkowski space. Yeah. Uh, in a usually, and when we write mu and nu, and you know, so in a particular coordinate system, eta mu nu might take a particular form, and in another coordinate system, it might take a different form. I'm going to work this out quite explicitly uh, this class, um, and also next class. So. Um, but I'm not quite sure if I've answered, I'm not quite sure I understood your question, however. Yeah. How about this? Why don't I uh, keep going because I think I might answer some of your questions during the lecture today. Um, and if I haven't answered them by the end of class, ask them again. Any other questions? Yes. Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> For an 8.30 a.m. class, it's beholden on you to do things like point stuff like that out to me. Okay. Uh, any uh, other questions? Okay, good. So the basic idea um, is something which is known as the equivalence principle. And the equivalence principle is probably the most single most important idea which underlies all of general relativity. And it's what allows us to uh, make the transition from special relativity to general relativity. And it's the basic principle that Einstein used in his formulation and discovery of the theory of general relativity. So what is the basic idea? Before explaining to you why this uh, is a correct statement, uh, the, let me just uh, outline to you the basic idea of the equivalence principle. And the idea is that in a small neighborhood, of every point in space-time, Uh, the geometry of space, or the geometry of space-time, looks approximately like that of Minkowski space. Uh, and so, uh, what do we mean by that? We mean that uh, space-time looks... Uh, in a neighborhood of every point in space-time, space-time looks like Minkowski space. In the same sense that if you had a sphere, for example, then in the neighborhood of every point on that sphere, it, that sphere looks approximately like a flat plane. So if you are an ant with particularly bad vision and you are sitting at some point on the sphere, then if you were very small compared to the radius of that sphere, uh, then you would not be able to distinguish that uh, from a flat plane. Uh, indeed, that is the realistic situation for ants uh, crawling on the surface of the Earth. Indeed, even humans crawling on the surface of the Earth. So roughly speaking, uh, the ant will have uh, a problem or they will be unable to distinguish between uh, the local neighborhood of that ant on the sphere and uh, that of a plane, which is tangent to the sphere. And uh, for 
Uh, geometric objects like spheres and planes, this is a rather intuitive notion, um, which is sort of obviously true. But the question is, why should such a statement be true of uh, space-time in general relativity? And what does this statement have to do with gravity? And uh, the justification for this statement is what is known as the equivalence principle. So um, the equivalence principle really has its roots in Newtonian gravity. So let me just remind you of uh, a few things that you already know. So in Newtonian gravity, we typically describe the motion of objects by uh, first figuring out the force on that object and then setting that equal to the mass times the acceleration of the object. And for the case of an object moving in the presence of a uh, gravitational field, such as the planets in the solar system, this force is determined by uh, taking the derivative of the Newtonian gravitational potential. For example, if you have uh, the sun, then the Newtonian gravitational potential falls off like 1 over r as a function of the distance from the sun, and its derivative falls off like 1 over r squared, and this is the standard 1 over r squared force law in the presence of gravity. Now, let's just uh, look at this equation here. And you'll notice, of course, something truly remarkable about this equation, which is that the m's will cancel out if you're studying the trajectory of a particle. And in particular, you could certainly imagine uh, the laws of physics could have been such that the coefficient sitting in front of the acceleration here uh, would not be equal to the coefficient in front of the gravitational potential. So you could certainly imagine that for any given object, there could be two uh, parameters with the dimensions of mass, one of which you could call the inertial mass and one of which you could call the gravitational mass, uh, which would sit in front of these two different, uh, the left and the right-hand sides of uh, the force law. And there's no uh, deep reason, you might think, why uh, those two constants should be equal. However, it turns out And this is uh, one of the most remarkable facts in all of physics, if you think about it. It turns out that the inertial and the gravitational masses are equal for every known object. You know, if it happened to be true uh, for a coffee cup, you might think, well, that might just have to do something rather special about the properties of coffee cups. And then if it happened to be true for a table, you might say, well, perhaps coffee cups and tables have some special features in common uh, for which this property is true. But if it's true for every single object in the known universe, then you begin to think uh, that this is an, uh, nature trying to teach you an important lesson. And the lesson that nature is trying to teach you with this fact is that gravity has a geometric origin. So let me explain why that is the case. <coughs> So what this means, of course, is that one can then factor the mass out of this equation and just write the acceleration as minus the derivative of the Newtonian potential. And what this means is that the equation of motion for a particle in a gravitational field is independent of the mass of that particle. It's determined only by the gravitational field and not by any particular properties of that object. So what that means is that um, unlike, for example, uh, the theory of electromagnetism, where the mass to charge ratio can be different for different sorts of objects, uh, in uh, a theory of gravity, there exists a preferred set of trajectories trajectories, uh, which all objects follow. So, 
So uh, unlike in electromagnetism, for example, the left-hand side of this equation involves the mass of the object, and the right-hand side, side is given by the Lorentz force law, which involves the charge. And m over q is different for different sorts of objects. So um, for example, if you put an electron in a constant magnetic field, it'll behave in one way. And for uh, a positron, it'll behave in some opposite way. Yes, there's a question. Um, absolutely. The case where mass is equal to zero needs to be treated a little separately. Uh, but in fact, you've already seen this case. We saw it last time when we said that particles with zero mass uh, will travel at the speed of light and hence will travel on null trajectories where ds is equal to zero. Uh, this, of course, is something that we'll return to again and again uh, throughout the class. But yes, um, this statement is also true uh, for particles with zero mass. Good question. So now this, of course, is a very old observation. Um, uh, Galileo, of course, proved it famously by dropping uh, various different uh, mass objects from the Leaning Tower of Pisa, or at least that's uh, what they tell us. You never can quite believe uh, everything they tell you, but I think that's probably more or less true. Uh, even, it's morally true, even if it's not actually true. Um, uh, so yes, this is uh, indeed uh, one of the most uh, important clues that we have in developing our theory of gravity. Uh, it means that all, there is a preferred, if in the presence of a gravitational field, there is a preferred set of trajectories which are followed by all objects independent of their mass. Um, this set of trajectories uh, has a name. They are known as inertial trajectories. Uh, for example, if there's no gravi gravity present, then objects will not be subject to any gravitational force, and they will all move with constant velocity. So in the simple case where there's no gravity, uh, these trajectories are just those trajectories with constant velocity. But of course, if you do have gravity, then these trajectories have a more interesting form. Indeed, uh, there's a sense in which if Newton had really thought deeply about uh, this fact 300 some years ago, 400 some years ago, uh, I guess 300 some years ago, uh, he certainly could have derived general relativity if he had thought, well, I don't know if he could have derived general relativity. He certainly could have realized that gravity had a geometric formulation. Uh, so this is a very simple fact, but it's a fact with very deep consequences. I suppose special, rel you wouldn't really have gotten anything right without special relativity, but you certainly could have given a geometric formulation to Newtonian gravity. Now, what Einstein did is he took this observation one step further. Uh, before I do so, uh, let me pause and see if there are any questions. So let's consider the following simple example. So let's consider a small region of space, or uh, more precisely, a small region of space-time, where the gravitational force is roughly constant. Now, uh, of course, uh, no matter where you are in space-time, if you consider a sufficiently uh, small region, the gravitational force will always be approximately constant in that region. And so let's call that constant minus a naught, because that's the thing that's set equal to the acceleration by uh, Newton's laws of motion. And the equivalence principle, or one formulation of the equivalence principle, is the statement that in this region of space-time, this very small region of space-time, the effect of gravity is identical to that of being in a constantly accelerating reference frame. with acceleration equal to a naught. This is, in some sense, uh, a completely obvious statement if you consider the following thought experiment. 
So what's an example of a small region where the gravitational field is approximately constant? Well, this room is an excellent example of that. There's a gravitational field pointing uh, down. The elevator down the hall is also an excellent example of such a uh, of such a place where the gravitational field is exactly constant. And uh, the size of that elevator will also make a, a suitably good small region where the gravitational field is exactly constant uh, because the gravitational field that we experience now is approximately constant to a very high degree of accuracy. So let's pretend uh, that I'm in a quirky mood and I set up uh, an entire laboratory inside that elevator to try and measure uh, the strength of the gravitational force which is pulling me towards the bottom of the elevator. So here I am, I'm sitting inside my elevator that elevator is not moving, it's just on the ground floor. And I'm subject to a force of gravity which is pulling me down uh, uh, with a particular force. And um, I could perform experiments in this elevator um, and I would discover that all of the objects in this elevator would travel according to the usual Newtonian laws of motion. So x double dot, where dot stands for d by dt, would be equal to g, or minus g, depending on which way I orient my coordinate system. Okay, so that's all well and good. But now let's pretend that I uh, have a second elevator, and this elevator is up in space somewhere, very far from the gravitational pull of the Earth or the Sun or anything like that. And this elevator is being towed behind a rocket ship, which is accelerating with constant acceleration. Okay, so let's say that I'm in, I have my whole lab set up inside this elevator, and this elevator is being pulled upwards at a constant acceleration, which is equal to uh, the uh, gravitational acceleration, g. So in that case, any physics experiment that I do inside that elevator will give an answer which is completely indistinguishable <laughs> from the physics experiments that I did inside that first elevator. So in particular, um, if I wanted to uh, uh, study the trajectories of moving objects uh, with respect to the coordinate system that is accelerating along with that elevator, then uh, the answer that I get would be completely identical to those <coughs> answers that I would get uh, in the first elevator that's just sitting on the first floor of the Rutherford Physics Building. Uh, so this is uh, an idea which is in some sense uh, completely obvious and something completely familiar to you, uh, but it's the basic starting point uh, for um, all of what we are going to say about gravity uh, in this course. So uh, if I wanted to be a little more precise, uh, then what I would say here is that there's a coordinate system that I could use uh, in this elevator, uh, which is not the standard inertial coordinate system uh, when I'm not subject to a gravitational field, but is related to that coordinate system by a coordinate transformation. So for example, if X denotes a standard uh, Cartesian coordinate, then the coordinate in as measured with respect to this elevator, which is accelerating at constant acceleration g, would be related to that by some coordinate transformation, x uh, prime is equal to x uh, plus or minus one half g t squared, so that, for example, even though I'm not subject to any gravity, I'll still have x prime equals to minus g, which of course is the same equation as observed by uh, our friend in uh, the elevator subject to a gravitational field. So in other words, in a sufficiently small elevator, gravity is indistinguishable from acceleration. Uh, this is a rather famous thought experiment 
Uh, this elevator is often called Einstein's elevator. Um, I believe he described mm -hmm. it in his one of his original papers on general relativity. Uh, and this formulation of the equivalence principle um, is just one of the uh, three formulations of the equivalence principle that we will discuss today. Um, it's usually referred to as the weak equivalence principle. Um, and we'll meet uh, two other forms of the equivalence principle uh, momentarily. Um, any questions before I continue? So what does this have to do with um, metrics and uh, line elements and all of that stuff? Well, um, the question that we can then ask is what does the line element of Minkowski space look like Uh, in this accelerated coordinate system. So we've decided that the presence of a constant gravitational field is just like being in Minkowski space, but in an accelerated coordinate system. Uh, we know how to talk about physics in Minkowski space uh, in terms of the invariant arc length. So what's the formula for the arc length in terms of this accelerated coordinate system? So remember that the accelerating x-coordinate is related to the usual x-coordinate by this formula. So we could then go ahead and write uh, the formula for the arc length. So remember the formula for the invariant interval so remember that the invariant interval is equal to minus dt squared plus dx squared. So let's just go ahead and what that would and ask what that would look like to our observer who's studying physics in this constantly accelerating elevator. Well, uh, all we need to do is just go ahead and take this uh, new coordinate expression for x prime and plug that into our formula for the arc length. Now, this is a computation that you will become intensely familiar with over the course of uh, this class. Um, uh, namely, we're studying how the metric changes under a coordinate transformation. Uh, so let's just go through it a little carefully uh, right now, uh, although you will do it again and again and again. Uh, so looking back later on in the semester, the computation I'm about to, you, uh, about to do right now will seem um, uh, tediously obvious. Maybe it'll be tediously obvious right now. Uh, let's see. So the idea is that we start with our original coordinates t and x and we wish to write things in terms of a new coordinate system t and x prime. So dt and dx in this formula right here represent infinitesimal displacements of the t and x coordinates. And what we would like to do is write this in terms of dt and dx prime, where dx prime is an infinitesimal displacement of the x prime coordinate. So what we need to do is ask if we take t to t plus dt and x to x plus dx, how does x prime change? So x prime will go to x prime plus dx prime, where dx prime can be obtained using this formula for the coordinate transformation in terms of dx and dt. So um, just staring at this expression, you can see that if x, t goes to t plus dt, x goes to x plus dx, then x prime will go to x prime plus dx prime, where dx prime is dx minus t dt times g. All I've done here is taken this expression in the curly braces and Taylor expand it to first order in our small displacements t dt and dx. So we could then go ahead and solve for dx so that dx is dx prime plus g t dt and then go ahead and plug into our formula for the invariant interval up here, 
in order to obtain an expression for the line element uh, to quadratic order in the small displacements dt and dx prime. So what is this? This will be minus 1 plus g t g squared t squared times dt squared plus 2 g t dx prime dt plus dx prime squared. So this is the formula for the line element in this uh, coordinate system, which is accelerating with constant acceleration g. And physics in a constant gravitational field is, by the equivalence principle, completely equivalent to physics in, Mink in uh, Minkowski space in this coordinate system. And the salient point is that this is equal to uh, g mu nu dx mu dx nu, where here x mu dx x mu re uh, represents the new primed coordinate system, but where g and g mu nu is not uh, a constant metric, but rather it's the metric whose uh, the two by two matrix in this case whose uh, values are given by these functions of t here which are no longer constant. So it's some off-diagonal matrix uh, with non-constant values. Yes? That's a basic question before. Yes, I understand. Um, so what this means is that if one wants to study gravity, then one is forced to consider uh, studying uh, space-time with a line element that is not constant. So gravity, morally speaking, will require us to change the metric of space-time. Now, if the only gravitational fields that were present in the universe were constant, we could end this class right now. Uh, we could all go home and spend the rest of our Monday and Wednesday mornings uh, happily asleep uh, in bed. Uh, but fortunately or unfortunately, that is not the case. And realistic gravitational fields, of course, are not constant. And so if the gravitational force is not approximately constant, uh, which is to say, if we are looking at a region of space-time uh, which is uh, not sufficiently small, or alternatively to say, if we are studying physics in a small region of space-time, but we are studying it very, very precisely, uh, then we cannot think of gravity um, as equivalent to being in an accelerated uh, reference frame. So let's say that I am a very talented experimentalist. Uh, this is a thought experiment, right? So we can pretend that I'm a talented experimentalist. And I'm in my elevator here. And I'm studying very, very carefully in my laboratory in the elevator the trajectories of objects in the presence of a gravitational field. So here is the Earth down here, uh, not to scale. And um, indeed, if I uh, am a very, very talented experimentalist, I will determine that the trajectories of two different objects on opposite sides of the elevator will not be quite identical, one of because they will be drawn towards the center of the Earth, which is not exactly straight down, uh, but rather they will point inward slightly. So in uh, a... Uh, sufficiently in a region of space-time which is not extremely small, uh, gravity is no longer completely equivalent to simply acceleration. And instead, what we will need is we will need some new dynamical principle uh, which will allow us to formulate the laws of gravity and to determine the metric of space-time. And that dynamical principle is known as Einstein's equations. 
And um, the formulation of Einstein's equations is our, our, our goal that we will be working towards for the first half of this course. So uh, in order to do that, what I would like to do now is present um, a slightly different formulation of the equivalence principle, which was initially formulated by Einstein. But before I do so, let me ask and see if there are any questions. So the Einstein equivalence principle is essentially uh, the same as the version of the equivalence principle that I stated before, but it's stated in a manner um, which will make it a bit more easy to generalize to take into account curved space time. So the Einstein equivalence principle is the statement that in a small region of space time, the laws of physics are identical to those uh, in special relativity. So, uh, for example, if you're studying uh, Maxwell's equations um, in a, a very general space-time, then if you restrict your attention to a very small region of space-time and you look at physics with sufficiently uh, coarse glasses, uh, then it will look just like Maxwell's equations in flat space, in flat Minkowski space, uh, that is to say, they look just like Maxwell's equations in standard vanilla special relativity. Uh, or another way of saying that is that space-time locally looks like Minkowski space R3, comma 1. Now, uh, I have to tell you exactly what that phrase looks like means. Uh, there's a precise mathematical uh, set of uh, meanings associated with that phrase, um, but for now uh, let's just t let's just follow Einstein. Einstein didn't really think too hard about uh, the precise definite. Well, he did, but uh, he didn't need to think too hard about the precise definition of that phrase. Um, and uh, if I wanted to, I could uh, rephrase this uh, equivalence principle uh, in an even more uh, precise uh, set of words as follows. So what do I mean when I say that space-time locally looks like uh, Minkowski space? What I mean precisely is that for any point in space-time, let's call it x naught, there is a coordinate system such that near x naught, the line element takes the form that it does in special relativity. So it's equal to eta mu nu dx mu dx nu plus terms uh, which vanish um, in the limit where x mu goes to x mu naught. So plus terms of order x mu minus x mu naught. So that uh, the metric, so that near any point in space time, there's always some coordinate system where the metric looks approximately like that of Minkowski space. And this is true near any point in space time. But the important point is the coordinate system that makes spacetime look approximately Minkowski um, over here might not be the same as the coordinate system that makes spacetime look approximately constant uh, somewhere else. And it's this difference that will lead, this difference is a result of the fact that spacetime has some curvature. And our goal then is to formulate this notion of curvature precisely. And along the way, one thing that we'll actually discover is that the uh, appropriate formulation of the Einstein equivalence principle actually involves the statement that you can demand that the metric look approximately Minkowski plus terms which vanish quadratically in uh, the uh, 
this in the uh, separation between our points and this reference point x naught. So this quadratic behavior, it turns out, um, is related to the structure of Lorentz transformations in special relativity. And um, the fact that you can set all of the linear terms equal to zero by a judicious choice of coordinate transformation <laughs> is something that we will return to um, and indeed is a very important uh, feature of the mathematics and physics of space-time. Um, so this concludes what I wanted to say about the equivalence principle. And um, this concludes also uh, what I consider the introductory material in this course. So uh, I gave you a brief review of special relativity and uh, the equivalence principle, which is the basic uh, physical idea underlying general relativity. And for the next three weeks or so, what we will do is uh, undertake a more systematic study of the mathematics of curved spacetime, uh, beginning with an attempt to make precise uh, this notion of uh, what it means for spacetime to locally look like uh, Minkowski space, and proceeding on to ask how it is that physics, the laws of physics can be formulated in a way which is invariant under coordinate transformations, and this will lead us at the end of the day to come up with uh, a very highly constrained uh, way of thinking about the curvature of spacetime. And it will essentially allow us to guess the equations of motion of general relativity um, uh, following Einstein uh, in a completely uh, constrained way. So uh, by thinking deeply about what it means for spacetime to be curved and how we wish to formulate the laws of physics, we will essentially be forced to write down Einstein's equations. Um, but before I uh, begin uh, this uh, rather long and intricate story where we develop the geometry of space-time uh, in some detail, let me pause and see if there are any questions. Yes? You said there were three uh, formulations of the curve? Um, I was counting the Einstein equivalence principle twice. Uh, that's why I put a prime on one of them. Uh, people also sometimes talk about the strong equivalence principle. That's essentially this, what they mean by the Einstein equivalence principle. Sometimes people talk about these two as having different names. In my mind, that's just a semantic. There's some semantics uh, that people uh, refer to. Um, yes, but these are two different formula. They're all different formulations of the same idea. Yes. So in the first uh, Einstein equivalence principle, does that hold true when there is gravity too? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, yes. Um, so, a lot of what people call tests of GR are secretly tests of the equivalence principle. Um, that's an excellent question. So, uh, the experiment that you're referring to is the gravitational redshift experiment by Pound and Rebka, which we'll actually discuss in some detail later on in this course. It's considered one of the three classic tests of general relativity. Um, there's a sense in which that's unfair because it's more a test of the equivalence principle. So the idea is that, um, as you know, if you're in a constantly accelerating reference frame, there will be a Doppler shift effect. Um, roughly speaking, because if I have, uh, if I'm emitting, uh, 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 if I'm emitting a photon, say, of a given frequency over here and observing it over here, if I'm in a constant accelerating reference frame, um, I'll be moving in different velocity when I emit the photon as to when I absorb it, so there'll be a Doppler shift. Um, this is true in an accelerating reference frame, hence it should also be true in a constant gravitational field. And what this means is that if I have, uh, if I'm emitting a photon up here and absorbing it down here, uh, where there's a relative difference in the gravitational field, uh, there will be a redshift <coughs> between these two, these 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 two points. Um, in so this was observed by Pound and Rebka in the 50s, um, and it was touted as a successful uh, test of general relativity. Um, I think it's more fairly described as a test of the equivalence principle. Um, now, there are also gravitational redshift effects which are related, which, you know, for example, if Pound and Rebka had been able to put their signal on a satellite uh, and then measure it on the ground, 
uh, then that, of course, the gravitational field would not have been approximately constant uh, in that regime. And so that would have been a much, a real honest, bona fide test of general relativity rather than special uh, relativity. Um, that test has now been done. Um, it's done every time you open up your uh, GPS receiver uh, in order to determine uh, your location. Uh, in fact, it's a very important uh, part of uh, the processing that needs to do in order to use a GPS receiver. Uh, but, the, but it's true that the original gravitational redshift experiment, which we'll describe in more detail later on in this class, um, was is in a sense a test of the equivalence principle. Yeah, so uh, just uh, as a general uh, 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 comment on the outline of this course, so roughly speaking, the first half of this course will be discussing first uh, mathematics and then the formulation of general relativity. Then we'll spend about two weeks going through all of the experimental tests of general relativity, gravitational redshift, gravitational lensing, and the precession of the perihelion of Mercury. Um, so we'll, we'll spend a, a class on gravitational redshift. Uh, good question, though. Any other questions? Yes? In, in, in what sense would that... that it looks like special relativity in an accelerating coordinate system. Do you understand? You see what I mean? Yeah. Uh, it looks like special relativity in the sense that if the uh, Harvard Physics Department were being towed behind a rocket ship moving at constant acceleration uh, with no gravity anywhere, um, they would have they would have gotten exactly the same answer. So it is a test of gravity, right? I mean, um, it's a test of you know it's 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 testing an effect due to the different value of the gravitational potential uh, between the first and the third floor of the physics department. Um, but it's not in a, it's testing only the most rough feature of general relativity, namely the equivalence principle. Um, it's not testing um, the form for the metric of space-time uh, in the presence of the Earth's mass, right? So, uh, which the other two classic tests of general relativity do uh, do test, and which has been tested to a great deal of accuracy now. Um, so, yes, that's that's a good question. I, I guess the converse of that is that the reference frame that looks exactly like uh, in space are ones that are falling inward. Yeah, of course one could all, exactly, exactly. Um, so another way of saying that is that if you're in an elevator or, well, you wouldn't be in an elevator very long, but if you're in an elevator whose uh, cords had been cut and which was falling, which was in free fall, uh, then of course uh, you would look like, as you, as you know, uh, it would look just like you were in Minkowski space um, except uh, with no gravity anywhere. Right? So if you had a long enough time to do some test of special relativity in this elevator before you went splat, then uh, you would quickly realize in the last moments of your life uh, that it was completely equivalent to being in Minkowski space without being in the presence of gravity. Um, you know, if you've seen those pictures of Stephen Hawking floating in his chair, right? Have you seen these pictures? Okay. Uh, you can pay a lot of money for someone to take you in a jet, but you'll do precisely that experiment. Any other questions? Excellent. Good questions. Please, uh, I encourage you all to ask as many questions as often as you like. Um, okay, so what I would like to do now is introduce a somewhat abstract no notion, uh, that of a manifold, which is the answer uh, to the following question. So the question we ask is, what is the precise uh, formulation of the notion that space-time is approximately in the sense uh, uh, that I described earlier. So let me say a little a little better. The space time uh, is locally something that looks like r three comma one. 
So the answer to that question is the following sentence. And it's a sentence that I do not expect you to understand. But it is the sentence, uh, space-time is a four-dimensional pseudo-Riemannian manifold. Okay, uh, space-time, you know what that is. Is and A, you know what those words mean. Four, you have a pretty good idea of where the four comes from. It's three space plus one time. Those are all dimensions, so you know what that word uh, means. Pseudo here refers to the fact that we have one time and three space directions. Uh, Riemannian, we will only understand later in this course when we formulate uh, the notion of uh, geometry a little more precisely. But manifold is the word that I would like uh, to uh, discuss today. So what is a manifold? So the word manifold is just the mathematical word that we use to describe a smooth space where one can d use all of one's intuitive notions of uh, limits, continuity, uh, series, uh, calculus, differentiation, and so forth, uh, without, uh, you know, you can use all of the notions of calculus uh, that you have used in your previous lives as mathematicians. A manifold is just a smooth space, possibly curved in some very complicated way, uh, where one can use these notions of calculus. And uh, my goal here is not to develop uh, in detail the theory, the mathematical theory of manifolds. Um, that is both tedious and unnecessary. Uh, I will just uh, introduce a few of the very basic concepts that we will need uh, later on in this course. So let me tell you precisely what it is I mean when I say the word manifold. So a d-dimensional manifold let's call it M, is a collection of points which can be labeled by coordinate systems in some smooth way. Um, it probably is worth uh, explaining exactly what I mean by the phrase coordinate system. So more precisely, a coordinate system is a set of D functions which uh, we can call xi, say, where i is an index that runs from 1 up to d, which label uh, different points uh, in some region of space, in some region of the manifold. Let's call it some region U of M. And we will require that these points uh, label these coordinate, uh, these functions xi label different points in this region uh, in a unique manner. Uh, if these coordinate systems uh, don't label points in this region in a unique manner, then that means that the coordinate system will degenerate in some way. Uh, just uh, let me introduce um, a little bit more uh, lingo. So um, the region U is often refer which these coordinates label is often referred to as a uh, patch 
or a uh, chart, uh, if, uh, in, a, in a slightly more mathematical language, of, of uh, our manifold. And uh, th we say that this patch is covered by the coordinates xi. So um, you may be wondering uh, why it is uh, that I'm trying to be so uh, freaking precise about uh, coordinate systems covering only some small patch of my manifold. And indeed, in your minds, you are probably thinking right now of coordinate systems which will cover all of your manifold. So there may be some coordinate system which covers all of the manifold that we're interested in, which means that it uniquely labels every point in our manifold, every point in space-time. So for example, in Minkowski space, the Cartesian coordinates t, x1, x2, x3 are a set of four functions which uniquely label points in Minkowski space. Um, and of course, these co such a coordinate system is great, um, and uh, we have a special name for those sorts of coordinate systems. Uh, we call these global coordinate systems. Um, but it turns out that coordinate systems which are not global in the sense that they might degenerate at some points or uh, not uniquely label some points are often very useful as well. And in general, uh, there are, of course, many different possible choices of a coordinate system for a given manifold and indeed for a given patch of any manifold. Um, so in that case, let's imagine that we have two different uh, coordinate systems. Let's call them xi and xi prime, which label uh, a given patch of space-time. So these coordinate systems are coordinates that we use to describe points in a given patch of space-time a given region of our manifold, then what this means is that you can write the coordinates xi as a function of xi prime, or conversely, you could write xi prime as a function of xi. So that means that we can write the change of coordinates Um, simply by writing uh, the xi's as a function of the xi primes. Or alternatively, we can write the inverse change of coordinates, the xi primes, as a function of the xi's. And um, the requirement that we impose that these coordinate systems label points in a unique manner, um, in fact, uh, boils down to a statement about the matrix of partial derivatives of these coordinate transformation functions. So first of all, uh, we require that these functions, so if you write xi as a function of xi prime, so these are three functions of, or four functions of four variables in the case where our manifold is four dimensional. So we require that these be uh, smooth functions 
uh, in the intuitive sense that uh, they're smooth functions, uh, or more precisely, from a mathematician's point of view, we would require that they be uh, differentiable to your heart's delight. Um, but you can just intuitively think of them as smooth functions. And we also require uh, the following property. So if you have these three functions xi as a function of the xi primes, then you could write down the d by d matrix of partial derivatives dxi by dx j prime. So uh, xi is an index that runs from 1 up to d, uh, which labels uh, the coordinates xi, uh, and the xj primes, so j prime is an index that also runs from 1 up to d. So this is a set of d squared derivatives that I could form, and I could think of this as a d by d matrix, and my requirement is that this matrix of partial derivatives have non-zero determinant. Or in other words, what we require is that the Jacobian matrix Ji J prime, which is defined to be the matrix of partial derivatives is an invertible matrix. So it is invertible as a D by D matrix. So I've introduced in uh, the last 10-15 uh, minutes a hell of a lot of new concepts, uh, which are both uh, trivial and confusing. So um, the idea of coordinate systems of chart coordinate charts or patches that cover different regions of a manifold, the idea of a Jacobian matrix, these are all ideas that I'm sure you have touched on at various points in your lives in classes on multivariable calculus and so forth. I'm introducing them here because I really want this all to be on the same page. And I want you to understand precisely what I say uh, when I say that space-time is a manifold, and precisely what I mean when I say coordinate transformation, coordinate chart, and so forth. Um, what I would like to do now uh, is just work through one example of a manifold, uh, some coordinate systems on that manifold, and uh, these Jacobian matrices in more detail. Um, but first, let me just uh, introduce a piece of notation which I have used already, uh, which some of you may be confused by. So you'll notice that when I introduced the Einstein summation convention last class, I was particularly neurotic about whether or not indices were superscripts or subscripts. And I have written down a formula here, dxi by dxj prime, um, where I have a superscript which appears in a denominator. Uh, in particular, I have the j prime. It's a superscript, but it's appearing in the denominator of this derivative. And so I am treating that as a subscript. And so one of the rules in uh, Einstein's summation convention is that when you take the derivative d by dx j, even though that j prime is a subscript, because you're taking a derivative by it, it's appearing in a denominator of a derivative. So it's treated as a subscript uh, for the purposes of the Einstein summation convention. Uh, this is an important, at this point, you will have to take this as a definition of what I mean by superscript and subscript. Um, by the time you work out your problem set due uh, next week, um, it will become very obvious uh, why that is an intelligent thing to do. There was a question in back, or was that the question? Uh, yes. D is the dimension of the space-time. Uh, so I is an index that runs from 1 up to D. So, uh, so for example, in the case of space-time, D is equal to 4. However, um, there are many other interesting examples of manifolds uh, where D is smaller than 4. Um, I'm using a general uh, value of D here because uh, 
very often it will be convenient to consider simpler cases where d is less than 4 as a way of developing our intuition about these sorts of things. Um, and for example, if you wanted to study uh, the world line or of a path through space-time, that would be an example of a one-dimensional manifold. And all of the concepts that I'm introducing for a four-dimensional manifold will also apply there. Uh, so I'm keeping D uh, to be arbitrary uh, for the time being. Okay. Yes? Yes, so there are all, so in your math classes, uh, there are all sorts of epithets that one applies to the word manifold. Uh, you know, uh, orientable, non-orientable, continuous, smooth, differentiable, complex, uh, you know, um, Hausdorff, you know, come on. This is a physics class, not a math class. So if you would, you know, so, we will introduce and encounter those concepts only uh, through acts of desperation, only as acts of desperation. Uh, so, um, yes, uh, usually we will take space-time to be an orientable manifold. I reserve the right to take space-time to be non-orientable uh, should, so, should I decide to do so. Um, but uh, if you happen to have studied manifolds in your math classes, you should feel free to think of these as differentiable orientable manifolds. Uh, and indeed, they will soon turn out to be Riemannian manifolds. Okay. But at this point, I haven't introduced that no notion yet. Um, so at this point, all of this business about manifolds, uh, Jacobians and all that stuff is going to be uh, a little bit abstract. So what I would like to do is just um, introduce um, an example which will allow you uh, to uh, realize that everything that I'm saying here is nothing that you do not already um, understand. So um, here's a simple manifold. The plane. Okay. You've spent a lot of time in the plane, right? Understanding its geometry, its coordinates, and so forth. So the plane R2 is a two-dimensional manifold. if I can spell that correctly, a two-dimensional manifold. And uh, there are lots of different coordinate systems that one can use on the two-manifold. Uh, for example, you could use Cartesian coordinates. So the manifold you should think of as a plane, which is just a set of point, points, and one can label those points by two Cartesian coordinates x and y. So these are global coordinates which cover the entire plane. But one could also consider polar coordinates, say r and theta. So r and theta are two uh, functions that one can use to label points on the plane. But the coordinates, the coordinate chart or the coordinate patch where the polar coordinates are defined is not all of the plane because this coordinate system becomes degenerate at the origin. In particular, the two functions r and theta don't uniquely label points at the origin because when r equals zero, any value of theta will refer to the same point. And so uh, that is reflected in the statement that these coordinates cover all of the plane, but the origin 0, 0 in the Cartesian coordinates. So we could then go ahead and write down, so if you let these uh, xi, uh, say x1, x2, be the Cartesian coordinates, and if we'll take the primed coordinates to be r and theta, so xi prime, let's take xi prime, x1 prime to be r and x2 prime to be theta, then uh, you can write down easily the uh, coordinate transformations that describe the relationship between these two coordinate systems. So for example, if you wanted to write down the xi's as a function of the xi primes, uh, you would say, write that as x is r cosine theta 
y is r sine theta. If you wanted to write the xi primes as a function of the xi's, you would write r as the square root of x squared plus y squared, and theta as the arctangent of y over x. And you could then go ahead and compute the Jacobian matrix. And you could you would find that this Jacobian matrix, J, which is the matrix of the partial derivatives of the x coordinates in terms of the x prime coordinates. So what is that? So the derivative of x1 with respect to x1 prime is the derivative of x with respect to r, which is cosine theta. Likewise, the derivative of uh, y with respect to r is sine theta. The derivative of x with respect to theta is minus r sine theta. And of y with respect to theta is r cosine theta. Did I get that wrong? No, that's right. So that's the Jacobian matrix. And the determinant of the Jacobian matrix is equal to r times cosine squared plus sine squared, otherwise just known as r. And this is non-zero when r is non-zero. So that is to say that this uh, Jacobian matrix uh, is not invertible at the origin where r is equal to zero. That's precisely the place where this polar coordinate system broke down. And so that's not the non-invertibility of the Jacobian matrix is just a signal uh, of the fact that one of our coordinate systems is breaking down. Any questions on that? No questions? So, let me introduce a little bit more uh, notation. So, when describing uh, the special manifold uh, that is space-time, we usually use um, a slightly different notation. So we usually use a Greek index um, to describe the coordinates of space-time. And we usually take that index not to run from 1 up to 4, uh, as you might think for a four-dimensional manifold, but usually we take it to run from 0 up to 3. So generally speaking, we will use Greek indices, mu, nu, and so forth, to refer to space-time, and uh, Roman indices, uh, i, j, and so forth, to refer to manifolds like uh, R2 or R3, which are Euclidean uh, rather than Lorentzian. Um, that is just a convention uh, that I use and that our textbook uses um, for the sake of clarity. Uh, it's by no means a standard convention. So, um, are there any questions before I continue? So let me just make one or two more comments uh, before concluding. So, although the notions that I've introduced uh, in this class about manifolds are, um, in some sense, rather trivial and probably um, quite obvious to at least uh, some, of, some of you, um, the notion of a coordinate transformation is really a very important notion. It's something you tend to gloss over a little bit in your um, earlier physics classes. But in fact, by thinking carefully about coordinate transformations, we will ab we'll be able to uh, get quite far in our understanding of the geometry of space-time. And so our goal over the next week or two is to find a way of writing the laws of physics in a manner which is independent of the coordinate system uh, used uh, to describe space-time uh, 
in any particular problem. So what we would like to do is find a way of formulating the laws of physics in such a way that uh, the actual physical content doesn't depend on whether you use Cartesian or polar coordinates to write down the laws of physics. So, for example, when you formulate uh, Newtonian mechanics, you often formulate things in terms of vector calculus because a vector is something that you view as a geometric object and the uh, components of that vector might take different forms in different coordinate systems, Cartesian, polar, and so forth. But by formulating the laws of Newtonian mechanics in terms of vector calculus, you're able to write down laws which, at the end of the day, are independent of the coordinate system that one uses to describe uh, these laws. And so this principle is the basic principle that we will be following when it, we develop the notion of geometry of uh, a manifold. Uh, in order to do that, um, what we need to do is we need to understand first how various quantities will transform under coordinate transformation. So we met our first example of this when we saw that the metric ds squared uh, was equal to eta mu nu dx mu dx nu, uh, where eta mu nu was the 4 by 4 matrix with constant uh, diagonal entries in Cartesian coordinates, but that it took a more complicated form in uh, another coordinate system. So um, what we need to do is understand um, exactly how it is uh, to formulate uh, laws of physics that are invariant under coordinate transformations. And in order to do that, we will need to understand um, with um, a, a certain degree of precision how it is all of the objects that you already know and love transform under coordinate transformations. And this will lead us uh, next class uh, and probably... Uh, in the following few classes to the theory of tensors. So the tensor, a tensor is at its most basic level um, an object which transforms in uh, a nice understood way under coordinate transformations. And although you probably have not encountered the word or if you have encountered the word you have not understood the word uh, tensor, in fact, you have already spent much of your lives as physicists dealing with tensors of one form or another. So there is a sense in which much of what we are going to do uh, in the sub these subsequent classes is merely understanding uh, correctly things that you have encountered previously in your lives as physicists, but not quite uh, understood uh, in uh, the most deep way. Um, so before I stop, are there any questions? Onward to tensors. So next class, we will discuss uh, what a vector is. Uh, you have probably met vectors, but you will meet them better tomorrow. Uh, maybe before we end, uh, we can have one final moment of discussion about the rescheduling of time for this class. So I know that one potential obstruction to Tuesday afternoon has disappeared. So who are the people who would not... who? had things on Tuesday at 4. I know that you were one person on Tuesday at 4. Was there anyone else? You were someone at Tuesday at 4. What is it that you guys have again? You have a class? You have a lab. Is it the same lab that you have? Probably. Okay. Um, is it the sort of thing that you could reschedule? It's the sort of thing that you have to show up for? Uh, likewise for you? Hmm. Because I do know that there are some people who have to skip part of the class today at the current time. How about this? What, what about the people, who, who are the people who had something beginning right at 10? Were you someone? It was just one part. You also have something beginning right at 10? No, 10. 
You have a class beginning at 10 or 10.30? 10.30, okay. So there's only one person. Yeah, no, I, I, no, a lot of people have classes beginning at 10.30, right? I'm just grasping for an extra half an hour here. Uh, how many people would be horribly upset if we started had class from 9 to 10.30? You would be horribly upset. You would not be... Yeah, you could show up to his class late, and that could be okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, how about this? Let's try, let's have class, let's see if we can have class at 9 instead of 8.30. Even that extra half an hour, how many people would like that? Okay, everybody. Most people. Okay. Um, let's provisionally hope that we can have cl class at 9 instead of 8.30 from now on. Um, I would really like to grab that Tuesday afternoon spot, but it sounds like that's going to be difficult. Um, how many people have a class that over how many people have a class that prevents them from coming to class right now? I know there's at least one person. Raise your who are, where are you? Wait, raise your hand. If you're not here because of a here, why don't I stop recording this? Um, okay, uh,